So I'll pull that out. Uh, Chris, I enjoyed your newsletter. Very good. Pretty much what we've been sharing in this class right here. Uh, and he, he gave it to me all written up and done bef uh, really before I shared in our last couple of classes. <clears throat> so if you get a chance to read it, read Chris Healy's newsletter. And if you don't get a chance to read his, read Madeline's. Oh yeah, that's right, she doesn't have one yet. All right, who, who do we have? We have Kayleen. Kayleen. Woo -hoo. What about? There could be an angle in there somewhere. Well, I would hope so. All right. And Kether. Kether? There could be an angle in there somewhere. And there's Sharon. Hi, Sharon. All right, so we got all the ladies and none of the men, which shows you what category is backsliding. <laughs> All right, let's turn to 1 Corinthians. The, we'll look at a few things in the second chapter. We're still... Uh, how, how many of you are who among you knows what pass we're on dealing with 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 3? If you know, raise your hand. Let me call on you. Mallory? Mm-hmm. Third pass. So this means that we have one more before we actually move ahead. I, I, a question came to me before, and I probably should ask it before we started everything, but has anybody heard from Emmy? Okay, so we, we've got several that have heard. Good, because I haven't heard a word from her, nor those of you who have heard from her. And I assume that the plane went down <laughs> and landed, of course. And she got off and she started anew. <laughs> we, better, we better hold all the comments. All right, so let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now this, of course, goes right along with what we've <clears throat> been seeing here about the wisdom of God. And we found in the first chapter <clears throat> that this wisdom, and we'll still be dealing with some stuff in the first chapter, but we found uh, that the terms uh, weakness <clears throat> and foolishness in the first chapter, weakness and foolishness have been linked to the cross. And that the cross, by God, is called wisdom and power. All right, so where's the discrepancy in that? I mean, that seems like a pretty, you know, doesn't it? Seem like a big discrepancy because uh, people are uh, calling uh, the cross foolishness. And they're looking upon it as weakness. <clears throat> And yet God calls it his own wisdom and power. And, um, but he calls it the power of God as seen in weakness. Jesus hanging on the cross, Jesus dying on the cross, and yet, yet not just the dying, but the whole process that got God to the cross, an emptying, a, a, a self-emptying, a humbling, uh, a process that took him from God to man to slave, servant, the word there really can be slave in Philippians 2, to dead. Well, what kind of Wisdom is that, and what kind of power is that? Well, it doesn't matter what kind of wisdom or power it is. It is God's wisdom, and it is God's power. 
and it is um, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 7 says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. It is hidden wisdom. <clears throat> All right, so you're not going to find this accidentally or just by going to church and hearing sermons or even, guess what, even hearing sermons about it. You're only going to get this from God. <clears throat> and, you know, I guess I need to put my <clears throat> usual disclaimer in especially during this season you know i really honestly feel like i have um, um, moved from a position of being pastor and bible school teacher and everything else to a position of being a student again and i feel i'm very much in the school of christ and very much just a student <clears throat> And so uh, and remembering that as I teach, therefore, I'm not teaching as a teacher per se, uh, not teaching as a pastor per se, I'm not teaching. I'm sharing with you, <clears throat> and because, because of this wisdom that we're talking about, I don't want to put this on anybody and the expectation of this hidden wisdom or this wisdom of God in a mystery, <clears throat> because I'm yet learning. And um, so if you get something out of these classes, great. And I would like for you to, but you're not going to really get it out of me. You're going to get it out of the Lord. And um, I just have... Um, I just, first of all, I just realized the huge gap between these two wisdoms. One is the wisdom of the world. It's the way we were born. It's not just the way we were born or the world into which we were born. It is the substance of who we are as far as how we think and the processes and everything else. That, that uh, we can talk about the wis hidden wisdom of God in a mystery found in weakness, found in powerlessness, found in uh, giving up. Uh, power as a means to accomplish the end, such as Jesus did on the cross, such as God did on the cross. <clears throat> um, but when we get away from the teaching and when we get in a situation where we want something done, I, I can assume human nature is going to return to its old standby, the wisdom of this age. I can assume that, and, I, and I'm not saying I assume that about you. I assume that of the nature of the beast, that it will do that. <clears throat> and therefore, to teach something, well, uh, uh, here's, a, here's a good example. Uh, verse 8 right here says, which none of the princes of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It's, now, it's still talking about what we just read in verse 7, this hidden wisdom. And when I was sitting there, uh, I just noticed, and, and I tend to do this, I'll circle, like, there'll be several sentences or whatever, a sentence in a, in a verse, and I'll see two words that link that are not on the same line, and I'll draw a little circle around both of them together to link them together. And the two that I linked together <clears throat> in verse 8 was, none knew. <laughs> none knew they didn't have one of them know none of, why why were they not informed were they not no it has nothing to do with information they didn't know they didn't they you could you know anybody ever said this phrase well i didn't see that coming they didn't see the cross coming. they didn't see this coming <clears throat> And you know what? There's no way that they could see it coming. There's no way that they could prepare for that because none knew of this hidden wisdom. They didn't know about it. They'd never heard of it. It was, it was not the way anybody had ever functioned before, and it wasn't common knowledge. And so here it says, 
In verse 6 of chapter 2, however, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. And, of course, that word perfect there is the word mature, not sinless perfection, but maturity. We speak a wisdom among them that are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the princes of this age. And I circle those two words, age, and that, that's the, if you have a King James, it probably says, what is it, world? But it's of this age, of this time period in which, and this, this spirit in which uh, men are dwelling in. And it called it the wisdom of this age, and the wisdom of the princes of this age. And then it says an incredible thing in the next verse. With my little circle around age, age, in verse 6, I went down and I noticed, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained, here's the, here's the little phrase, before the ages. The wisdom of this age, this eon, this, and the princes of this age. But this is a wisdom of God that is before the ages. Is that powerful or what? I mean, this is, I mean, this is just ripping the wisdom of this world naked for what it is. And it is, and he's declaring that, in other words, this wisdom of God in a mystery that seems so unheard of and unrecognized, none knew, is the ancient wisdom of God before there was man, before there was a world, before there was an age, the ancient wisdom that is God, the ancient viewpoint of God, the ancient knowing of God, the ancient um, how to proceed, because wisdom isn't just knowledge and facts. It is the, uh, the, the information as to how to proceed, if you will. That's not the best way of saying it, but <clears throat> it relates to living it. This is, this is whatever, they, whatever they missed always was. Whatever seems so normal to everybody's way of thinking is transient, is temporal, is foolishness to God. Well, I'll, I'll just get what I want. I'll do this. Or I'll, you know, well, I'll, you know, I'll be real sweet about it, but I'll talk them into so-and-so. Or well, and, well, however you, you know, it doesn't matter what form it takes you know the, I use the example of of water and so we say okay well I'm gonna I'm gonna change and we turn into ice but ice is just frozen water it's exactly the same molecules and exactly the same stuff and so we say okay well I'll change again and so we turn into water vapor and we say oh, I'm floating I'm not hard anymore <laughs> you know like ice you know exactly the same you know atomic makeup and subatomic makeup, it's water. And so all the changes that we go through, and they're all outward appearance, because again, if they're all the same atomic makeup, atoms and, uh, of oxygen and hydrogen, I mean exactly the same, then all that has happened with water and ice and water vapor is, is changed its outward form. And men get fooled by a change in outward form. Well, you know, what's the, what's the modern day term for that? Well, I'll just reinvent myself. Well, you, first of all, you didn't invent yourself in the first place. God did. <laughs> all right. So, I was, uh, I was, just my being was exploding with this concept of the wisdom of this age and how, you know, how do you, 
how do you wrestle it to the ground? How do you deal with it? It's so prevalent in everyone. It is, it is so prevalent that it is invisible. Meaning, you know, I mean, that, that we don't even know it's there. We don't know how deeply it has reached past our pores, into our DNA. We don't, we don't realize it. But it is how we think naturally. <clears throat> All right, so with that, I'm just going, you know, and, and, and who knew? None knew of this other. None. None knew of this other wisdom. And so what hope is there? And it brings me to say to you, don't worry about what I teach from now on, particularly from the rest of my life, because I've been incredibly changed in my viewpoint and am being changed. Don't listen to me. And we've always taught that, but I'm just going to say it again. You know, we, we've never believed in this place that you have to think like what I think or believe what I think. You don't. If ever there was a time I wanted to make sure that you don't, this is the time. <laughs> because the chances, chances are you're going to think you've got something when you don't. And I'm still in a place, and I'm being absolutely honest with you, I'm still in a place where I'm Google, I mean, really, I feel like a little baby. And there is no need putting on someone something that they don't have by life. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to tell you pretty much, unless I'm preaching on Sunday, which usually is more of a pastor than whatever this guy is up here now. What, what he is, I know not. What status he is, I care not. Other than Sunday or Sunday night or whatever, for the most part, I wouldn't even listen to me as far as believing or trying to get it. I know that sounds strange. But in the magnitude of this wisdom of this age, none knew how in the world am I ever going to change anybody's thought processes or bring anybody to anything. I'm not. Don't believe me. I feel like I'm either seeing the Lord or I have slipped off the deep end. Okay? You follow me? And it's all along this line of the power of God and weakness. Okay? And I'm seeing I'm seeing something that I haven't seen to this degree before and I I would just rather you consider me crazy for a while. Okay? I encourage you to keep loving me and, you know, don't stone me yet. But I'm I'm just trying to set it right here that there is no way that I'm putting this expectation on you. I want to see this until it's who I am. And I know that you want the Lord, but want the Lord in your heart the way you want the Lord, not the way I want the Lord. <laughs> okay? Did that sound crazy enough for you? Good. Good. All right. So just think of this crazy, dumb guy coming in from now on. He's going, oh, he's, we still love you. And let the idiot walk out at the end, okay? <clears throat> All right. Uh, so let's go to the first chapter and let's look at uh, verse 27. <clears throat> You know, what, let's look at verse 18 again, though. It's the founding verse. It says, The preaching of the cross in the King James, but the actual Greek is the word of the cross, 
is to them that perish is foolishness. You know, we get hung up on that word to them that perish. We just need to read it for what it really is. The, the, preach, the word of the cross is foolishness. But unto we who are saved, it is the power of God. And the word concerning the cross involves the wisdom of God as seen in weakness. And it is foolishness, folks. I'm just going to say that a million times. It's just foolishness except to God <laughs> and to those who are Saved and whatever that means. Well, that means those who are joined one with him in mind and heart and being so that they can taste and see the reality that he's talking about and not just hear foreign words. Does that make sense? I mean, you know, so. <clears throat> so then now, verse 27, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world and... <laughs> We really use that one, you know, well, okay, I'm a bad sinner or I'm an idiot. God still chose me. And it, it really can justify major uh, being out of whack, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, God has chosen the foolish things of the world, you know? Um, <clears throat> what is that scripture that talks about oh, being fools for Christ? Oh, that didn't, that is nothing about being stupid at Mardi Gras when you're trying to minister to people on the streets. It really isn't, and it's not about, uh, I've been around a little while, and it's not about all the people that talk about, oh, I'm just a fool for Christ. Every example I've ever heard of that is not this. This is, to be a fool for Christ means that you have embraced a way where you relinquish, you renounce your power, you renounce your status, you renounce your rights so that you might go into something concerning a death that will help someone else that doesn't deserve it at all and in fact is your enemy because that's what we were to God. I mean, we call ourselves sinners, folks. Sinners were enemies. And I don't want to get into that too early, but that's, you know... We don't realize the depth of this thing. So, so this is someone who has embraced Christ crucified. If, if they're a, well, being a fool for Christ, they are literally entering into a death that they don't deserve and, a, and an appearance of foolishness that is not truly who they are for others. Scott? giving your life for others that love you, then, then there's, there's no, there's really, I mean, it's easy. Yeah, but I you mean, didn't do that. You know, but if you're going down to death the just for the unjust, then all this stuff that's flying at you from that very person you're laying your life down for. And so if it's not real, all kinds of stuff is going to start coming up. And it does. The very nature of this cross, I'm going to just use that word, makes you vulnerable to worse than you would have ever gotten otherwise. Okay. Don't listen to me <laughs> and don't believe me. Okay? Because we don't all have to believe exactly the same thing. All right, so, um, so when we get down here, he, he says, but you see your calling, brethren, how not many, no, but, but God hath chosen the foolish things and the weak things. Folks, this is a calling. It's a calling. It's not just the call or, or a, it is a calling to which you're called to live because of the reception of Christ crucified, the Lamb, the nature of God. It's a calling in relationship to this, which involves 
foolishness and weakness. For you see your calling, brethren, uh, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world and to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world. It's something you're being called to, not something that you were, you know, just I'm foolish and I'm an idiot. Well, I, I like foolish idiots. I just prefer them. But it's not just that he, you know, I like idiots. I know that the membership of this church seem to contradict that. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Do not take that out of here. And <laughs> I'm sure that the leadership in this church contradict that there. Not the members. I'm sorry. I messed up. All right. <clears throat> but the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisest that have the wisdom of this age, even though they can work the system, even though they can get what they want, even though they can come out on top, even though they can power over people and, and not be intimidated or whatever, even though all of that is, is there, the scripture says that they come to naught come to nothing they will come to nothing only that which is of Christ known by the cross <laughs> Christ crucified is going to have an eternal reality to it ultimately and yet, to, to go that way, to go that way, means to appear to lose everything. Anybody see how foolish that looks? <laughs> Does anybody see how foolish that it would be to teach, try to teach to anybody? With, the, with any amount of the wisdom of this age in their head, that would be a struggle. So I ain't trying to teach it to you. Just hear it and say, well, he already told me he's an idiot. Okay. Jennifer? Well, I was just thinking that the foolish thing of the world that God has chosen and the weak thing is the cross. Like that's, the, that's really what it's talking about. That's why he said everything before this, that's what he's it's talking about. It's not like there's any, like, he just, like you were saying, it's not like he just looks at somebody who's getting beat down and he right. really likes Right. The world in itself doesn't contain that. But right. the thing that's foolish that's in the world that the world calls foolish, is, it is that. It is the cross. It right. is that. And, you know, the scriptures say, humble yourself and he'll exalt you. But if you exalt yourself, he'll humble you. We would, we would assume that somebody who is humbled by this world, by poverty, by physical ailment and everything else, well, he's, he's the... He's the um, the foolish and the base and the and the weak things of this world and God would choose them but that's absolutely couldn't be true and you I use the example of India all the time because there's so much deformity and physical lack and hunger and everything else which is everything that, you know, the foolish things and the weak things of the world and the base things of the world. So I love India so much so that I exalt it. And now, if you need any tech information, you'll get somebody from India on the line. Well, if that's the best exalting he can do, that's not that good, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, it is, it is this, what Jennifer was saying. It is this reality of... What humbles itself, what doesn't push itself forward, what, what repudiates, really, I mean, in Jesus' case, his own godhood, and all of the trappings that come with that, becomes a man and then becomes the lowest of man, and a slave. A, that word servant is the word slave. It, we, I think somebody in King James put it so that 
I think the wisdom of this age might have been working in them because they didn't want to look so bad being a slave. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a servant. I serve you. And we go, oh, what a precious brother. He's got such a servant's heart that's so haughty. <laughs> Whatever. So, um, so really, uh, 27, 28, 29, all of this is really wanting us to embody what's in verse 18 through 25. Not, not to just um, uh, learn some truth about Christ when he went to the cross but to embody Christ crucified. To embody it. All right. So, let me read something here. The wisdom and power of God, then, is defined not by a great theological position or great demonstrations of supernatural, but by embodying the way of the cross, this word of the cross along with its corresponding way of the cross, cuts across the grain of the pride that comes by nobility, position, status, and it declares that the way of the new creation is on a completely different basis of motive. That's why, folks, you know, I've already shown you how the little phrase being a king's kid is not scriptural, nor is it even right thinking. But honestly, um, you know, I shouldn't really waste our time here tonight, but years ago, <laughs> um, you know, like in the 30s and 40s and 50s, particularly the 40s and 50s, there came a new movement of supernatural power and God doing things and tent meetings started. And who came out to the tent meetings? Not the rich people, all the poor people. And there were things that were being taught right up through the 60s that was trying to break the spirit of poverty on God's people. Whether that was financial poverty or spiritual poverty, you are a king's kid. No, you're not. You're not Jesus' kid, and he's the king. You'll never be Jesus' kid. You're not a king's kid. I don't know that the father's ever called a king. You are his kid. But I'd be very careful going around saying I'm Almighty God's kid in that spirit, in the same spirit of I'm the king's kid. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> so this influx comes through, and it's trying to save everybody from poverty, and it's real, it's real sweet and it's real great, but basically it's massaging people's self-image based on massaging their soul and their self, you know, their ego, their it, id, their I, you know, yes. Yeah. And, and yet that seems to be what it's taught. It, it's, it's looking down on the weak because yeah. we're trying to make them strong in themselves and not in the Lord, but using it as right. in the Lord. Um, yeah. and, and let me make sure that, that we all understand that <clears throat> By saying what I just said, or Carolyn saying what she just said, that we're in any way saying that that movement didn't have God in it, that a lot of people were touched by God. I was one of those in the 60s, and I thank God for what I did experience, and it brought me along in the Lord. 
uh, nor am I saying that we're the only ones who really have the truth, so that's why you need to come here, because I've already started this class saying I'm an idiot, don't believe anything I say. And, and I've also said we don't all have to believe alike, particularly with what I say. But folks, there are flaws in us, there are flaws in our teaching, and there are flaws in their teaching, and in them, and in generations to come there will be. The heart must be not to put down other people, because that's the same thing as the wisdom of the world. Folks, it is. The only way I can get become something is I have to put down other people. And there are people who that's how they get there, you know, because they feel like they look better when they put everybody else down, you know. Now, there are some people who would hear them put everybody else down and go, gosh, I don't even want to be around people like that, you know. But there are some people, I mean, you know, there's some reality TV shows, most of them intentionally hire people that will do that, put down everybody else to make themselves look good, you know. That's why I watch them all the time. <laughs> all right, so... Um, the word of the cross, oh, well, let's say I said that. <clears throat> right. So why are the terms weakness and foolishness linked to the power and wisdom of God? Because God's power and wisdom are demonstrated at the cross. Power, I mean, uh, foolishness and weakness are linked to God only at the cross, if you will. When you present... Behold, Israel, your Messiah, and he's hanging outside the city limits on a cross with thieves on either side of him. And you're telling them he's the Messiah. They're not buying it. It's foolishness. It's not even just sort of bad judgment and... and Pointing to him, it's literal outrageousness. And so that linking of those things happens with full clarity at the cross, where the wise of this world call God's wisdom foolishness at the cross, and God calls their wisdom foolishness as he points to the cross as true wisdom. So, you, anybody see the dilemma here? <laughs> the constant dilemma? <clears throat> All right. Um, let's see. Because um, the cross is the revelation of the living God's wisdom and power. So there's no need praying for wisdom if you're asking for the wisdom of God and expecting anything else but something to be revealed concerning Christ's self-giving manner at the cross. You know, I mean, we do it all the time, though, don't we? Lord, just give me wisdom. I mean, can you see yourself being hung up on a cross? You know, I mean, I'm just trying to be honest here. God forever links his wisdom and his power to the cross. It's not, it's not too outrageous in my mind of insanity to see that if you're asking for wisdom, this is the wisdom you're asking for. If you're asking for the wisdom of God. You're asking for weakness, not strength. You're asking for powerlessness, not power. You're asking for an opportunity to let Christ crucified come out of you. Okay? The Lamb. That means that all of Israel and even among the Greeks must now give up their old concepts of how they conceived God to be and must now embrace God's explanation of himself as defined by the cross. Therefore, anyone who purported to know God must now have their wisdom measured 
by the cross. I have measured them and found them wanting. Anybody know what book that's in? Book of Daniel. Meeny, meeny, tackle you farson. Didn't know I knew Babylonian, did you? <clears throat> well, I've hung out with a few. <clears throat> I have measured you and found you wanting, and from now on, God, you know, any, any conception of the wisdom of God or the reality of God, he has forever linked himself as the crucified God And everything must now be measured by the cross. <clears throat> this includes a surrender of its own wisdom and power. In other words, the wisdom of this age. A surrender of its own wisdom and power. And that means that if you have any particular powers that you have been given prior to seeing the cross, that probably used a lot before the world, before, I mean, before salvation. But we sanctify it and said, okay, well, I have, the, I'm very persuasive, so, and I use that all the time. Or I'm, you know, very pretty, so I have, you know, I, I draw people into it. Or I'm, I'm, I come off so dumb that everybody just wants to help me. Or... <laughs> You know, can y'all hear who's laughing the loudest? Yeah. I've been saving that for you, buddy. <laughs> Not true. Mike is much more devious than dumb. Oh, I mean, no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Patty's sitting back there going, get him, yeah, oh. <laughs> all right this includes a surrender of its own wisdom and power for an embrace of God's wisdom and power that's impossible almost I just wish y'all could see this the way I see it that's impossible I wrote that that's impossible to Expect that of anybody ultimately is impossible other than if God decides to show himself and we see the cross and we see Christ crucified and we go, oh my God, we serve a crucified God. How many Christians serve a crucified God? I mean, you know, they know Jesus was God and he died, but it's different when you put it like that, isn't it? Because it starts defining God, and he chooses to be defined by the cross to this day. You know, somewhere in my notes, and I don't know where, but I wrote, I wrote people are not walking around with jewelry around their neck with a little tomb with a stone rolled away. It's not the resurrection that defines him. It's the cross. It's the symbol of the cross. This perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us, not because he rose again and gave us anything. I know. I know. Don't do not listen to me anymore. <laughs> All right. This facet of God makes him completely unacceptable to Greeks. Completely unacceptable to Greeks and to, and Jews who would laugh at such a presentation of God and consider it all foolishness? What is our response to such a presentation? Are we Greeks? Are we Jews in our response? The answer should be yes, unless we're, you know, unless we're either seeing something of this or we're trying to become acceptable by embracing something that's not true or real in us, nor do we have a heart for it. 
let's not go that direction. You know? Let's not be moved by peer pressure and that sort of stuff. Let's be moved by the Lord or let's not move. Let's just say it. Yeah, this is how I think. This is what I would prefer. I don't prefer the cross. I don't like the way it looks. <laughs> I don't look good on wood. <laughs> Oh, Lord, help us. It doesn't match my eyes. <clears throat> this is more difficult for me to get through than you'll ever know. <clears throat> as stated earlier, when pointing to the cross, Paul calls the weakness seen there as the power of God. In the same manner, he calls the wisdom of it foolishness. Men seek for greatness, but Jesus took poverty in place of wealth and took our sin in place of remaining untouched and holy. It was Christ's death that ended all that was evil and wrong. The law, Galatians 2, or Galatians 3.19, was through death that the law was defeated. Romans 6, or Romans 6, 7, sin, it was through death. Hebrews 2.14, the devil was defeated through death. Romans 6.11, <clears throat> I hope I'm getting these right here. The old man, yes. Galatians 6.14, the world, on and on and on. Every enemy, every enemy, folks. We have come up with doctrines of, of fasting or prayer or or witnessing, or something else, when the Bible clearly you know, declares over and over and over again that these enemies are only defeated through death. But do I want to be connected to just the concept of death all the time? That was the question that every Jew had to answer when Christ began to be preached. Because those boys didn't have a whole mixture of pottage with poison in it. They had more purity of a reality that this was about. Not even, I mean, look at Philippians 2, folks. It mentions his death. It mentions uh, let this mind be in you. But it has nothing to do with salvation. It doesn't even mention those benefits for us. It's a whole reality of the cross. that deals with conforming to him. Paul said that I might be made conformable to his death. Now, I want to know him in this and this, but what I want to conform to, I mean, come on, think. Put, put, let's put ourselves back in that first century when, all, when this was being spread and go, man, you know, somebody, you know, you meet them on the street or something, they start telling you about Jesus and everything, and something within your heart just rises up, and you go, oh, my God, you know, and you get that sense that this is the truth and everything. But then they keep wanting to link everything to death, and what decision are you going to make? I mean, I know what the Greeks are going to make. I know what the Jews are going to make because they have the wisdom of this age, which says, I don't want death. I want, you know, just preach resurrection, which, you know. I don't blame them for running. I don't blame others who hear me speak. I don't, I, don't, I want to run. I have the wisdom of this age. But I also am beginning to enter into what the new creation really is. <clears throat> and by it, because it says, it talks about the new, old things are passing away. See, well, that don't sound like a finished work of the cross. I mean, that's the original Greek, isn't it? Old things are passing away. That's not, you know, it doesn't sound like a, the finished work of the cross, you're dead. You're just dead. Well, it sounds to me like there's a slow process of a changeover, of a renewing of a mind and of a reality 
that is set not on death as we comprehend it, but as death comp- compre- as God comprehends death, and that is selfless giving to the sacrifice of ourselves and anything else for others. That's God's concept of death, really. I mean, it is. All right. So let me make sure I've read some things here because we're getting close to wrapping this this one up. The resurrection is not declared to be the the victory. It opened the door for the new creation, but the new creation came as a result of death and exists because of self-giving. It is a loss for gain that brings it about. For, uh, you, know. you can't deny that that's true for Jesus. It was his loss for our gain that brought it about. You can't deny that. The people don't deny it for Jesus 2,000 years ago. They have a hard time when it wants to be applied to them. I'm not applying it to you. This doesn't apply to you. This only applies to them that are saved. I mean to, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. This only applies to, to those that are in that place and that by life could live it. How could it apply to them? Maybe it applies to that God wants you to know this, but it doesn't apply to you until it has been revealed in you. Not Christ, Jesus lives in me. That's not the revelation of Christ in you. The revelation of Christ in you is who Christ is that lives in you. And that, you cannot, you'll never be able to get away from it. That relates to a self-giving Christ, a self-giving God, a self-giving Messiah, a self-giving Lord. And even that, you know, someday I hope to really expand more on the lordship of Christ and exactly what that is in terms of the scriptures, in terms of what he's talking about. All right. So it is loss for gain that brings it about. This is how we are to accept his death as accomplishing this, but also with this being the way of victory that God wants us to embrace as our wisdom and our power. <clears throat> Seven minutes. Seven is the will of God, isn't it? Or is it three? I forget. Seven is the will of God. All right. Could anybody see how for someone who had the wisdom of this age, which primarily involves the promotion of self, and they got introduced to the wisdom of God. Did I get say that right? Which is primarily about self-giving. Can anybody see how these two wisdoms could form a war within somebody? Could, could you see how, how the wisdom of this age isn't half, it fills everything, and this wisdom of God in a mystery that is found in weakness and powerlessness, how it would be like a foreign invader. Like Carol knows, your body, like a germ or something coming in, and your whole body rises up to attack that thing. And it would be like a foreign invader. But then, because there is this witness of your spirit, you would say, but I know this is God, so you would get around it closer, which would allow it in a little more. There would still be clashes, and the greatest clashes would come in times when you, when your will was to have something that you wanted. It's just reality here. 
and and to hear the wisdom of God would no longer sound like a beautiful song. It would be like somebody scraping their nails on a chalkboard. Could you see how that could possibly, maybe? <laughs> you know. And you just, it would be like, I don't, you know what? I ain't going with this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? Um, because I want, and of course, if you seek to save, you're losing more. Jesus said that. If you seek to save yourself and all that, you're going to lose. But we do, and of course we do. And so then we feel things slipping away, and then because we're not confronted so much at that moment, because we went with the wisdom of this age, we feel it starts slipping away. We start wanting to turn back to God. But we don't know that the God we turn back to is the God of the cross. We don't know that the wisdom, if we're going to ask him for any help or wisdom or power, where is he going to go with it? He's already told you where he goes with it, and that's where he's going to go with it. He, he can't help it, okay? And so somehow because we're not confronted with the moment, which is the nails, whatever that is, in our, that we want, and that because we've said no to the lamb, we've said no to, to Christ crucified in that way, we got our way. But then, you know, it feels empty or wrong somehow. And so we want to get back with the Lord, and we do. And because this is his wisdom, he dies one more time. If you understand, please understand. I'm, I know he's not constantly that, but... He lays down his life and hugs his enemy. <laughs> it's just that way. It's wonderful, but it's abuse. <laughs> We're abusing him. I mean, but it's wonderful that we have him. But guess what? Even in allowing that, there is that possibility that there is more link up than there was before with, with him, Christ crucified. Do you see what I'm saying? More, little, little, little more, ever so small. But because there's more, more that life comes or wants to come or begins to come. And even in our failures, because the cross looked like the failure of God. It did. People to this day write about it and say, well, Jesus failed in his mission and they killed him. <laughs> they got the wisdom of this world. They don't see the wisdom of God. None knew. How many? None. Not a one of them picked up on it. They, could, they couldn't see that kind of wisdom. All they can see is you failed, Jesus. And all they can see in you is you failed. And all he can see is I'll die for you. I'll give myself. I'll surrender. I'll make myself vulnerable however much it takes because my kind of love sacrifices itself. And so, so you're never out of hope. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Even when you're wrong and fail him, it doesn't change the faithfulness of God. It can't because, and I won't spell it all out right now, but I'll just say because of Christ crucified because of the nature of the be, being that is Christ crucified. All right. Did we run out of time? Are we, are we gone? One minute. Okay, let me make sure. <clears throat> I finished. That was it. Okay, take a break. We'll come back.